I'm going to tell you something, uh, Carly and Jake, I love them, and Carly was over there running in place as hard as she could, she's like, I'm hurrying, I'm hurrying as quick as I can, amen, and uh, praise the Lord, better hurry up. Well, turn, if you will, in your Bibles this morning over to the book of Matthew, we're going to start at Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 35 of that passage of Scripture, we're going to talk about a heavenly labor day, a heavenly labor day, Matthew Chapter 9, beginning in verse 35 of that passage of Scripture, this passage will give us sort of a lay the foundation for what I'm going to talk about this morning. It's found in verse 35 says, Jesus went through all of the towns and the villages, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming what the good news of the kingdom. How many of y'all know it is good news? Amen. And healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds... He had compassion on them because they had been burdened and they were helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus says in verse 37, then he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send more workers into the harvest field. May God bless the reading of his word, Labor Day. We celebrated every single year. I wonder if we know the true definition of it. It really began back in the ni- late 1920s and 1930s. Uh, and the labor unions set aside a time to acknowledge the workforce. And it was at that time a, a time that they would celebrate and they might have a meal together or something to acknowledge the workers in different unions and such as that. But it was only in 1984 that we made it a national holiday. So in 1984, it became a national holiday, and by definition of our national holiday, it is a day to acknowledge the contributions of the workforce in a functional society. Thank you, every one of you, for being a part of the workforce. Amen? You can't truly appreciate something unless you consider what it would be like without them. So I wonder if we might imagine that for just a second. What, what if we had no, no farmers? Julie, where, where would we be? What if we had no police 
force that got up every morning or every night and, and did their jobs? What if we had no emergency workers that would come to our aid? What if we had no production lines and no cars and, and no clothes that were being produced by them? What if we had no grocery stores or anyone to serve us? How would our society function without the workforce that gets up day in and day out and goes and helps us to have a functioning society? Today, I've come to acknowledge the fact that God also has a workforce. It's you and it's me. God's got a workforce. He's got a labor force. And my friend, every single person sitting here today, I want to say thank you for what you give to God. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for contributing to the work of the good Lord. And we know that it's being prosperous because people are being saved today. God has a workforce. He began the enlistment process back at the ascension. When Jesus ascended up into heaven, he then left us with the responsibility of carrying on the work of God. He entrusted within us what would then be the work of the Lord upon the face of the earth. You do it. It rests on you today. You see, that's a marvel to me that he would take the most important thing in the universe, which was telling people about his sacrifice, the gospel, the good news, and he would entrust frail Sinful mankind to do the job. He could have done otherwise. God could have chosen the angels to part the skies and to come out and proclaim the gospel, but he did not. He could have made the rocks cry out the gospel of the good news, but he did not. My friend, he chose you and I to carry on the work of the Lord since the day that he went up into heaven, my friend. I don't know that I would have entrusted y'all that much, amen? (laughs) Because I'm telling you, my friend, it was a risk. But it's not a plan A for God. It is the only plan he has. And if we fail, my friend, people die and go to hell as a result of it. My friend, we must be about the labor force. We must be doing the job for which he has equipped us to do. And in this passage of Scripture, Jesus stresses the importance thereof. He says two things in that passage I read to you in Matthew chapter 9. First, he said, the demand is great. The demand is great. He said, he looked out upon all of the people and he said, the harvest is plentiful. I'm telling you, my friend, it's abundant. And if you look out there, if Jesus thought that the harvest was abundant then, how much more today? As we look out upon a lost and dying world, and it says that Jesus saw their suffering. He saw the weight that was on them. My friend, we need to look out today as Jesus did and see the suffering of a society today. We need to see that they're broken. We need to see that they're helpless. We need to see that they need a shepherd. And that shepherd, my friend, is none other than Jesus Christ. The demand is high. But in this passage of Scripture, he also says the production is low. He said the harvest is great. All about the workers. The workers are you the demand is great but the production is low and my friend we need to understand and he helps us to understand the importance of the workforce you are important to God today and you are important to the work of God today you see he tells several parables about this idea of helping us to understand how important it is for us to be involved in the work of God He tells a parable about seed time and harvest, and he talks about farmers. And he talks about planting the seeds and then bringing in the harvest. I I look for that song, Bringing in the Sheaves, in 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 the songbook. Couldn't find it to save my life. I don't know if it's not in there or not. It's not. But I wanted to find that. Bringing in the sheaves. Because Jesus gives stories about going out and planting a harvest and bringing in the production at the end of it, my friend. I'm telling you, no farmer ever has sat on his porch not having planted seeds and expecting a harvest. You'd be a fool to do so. 
Oh, but my friend, I'm telling you, if you look out today, we ain't planting the seeds, but we want the harvest. We want full churches. We want altars full. We want people say, ain't nobody planting no seeds. You see, my friend, that we, he tells this analogy to help us to understand you are vital to the process. We got to get out there. We got to plant. We got to sow. We got to tell. We got to reach. We got to love. And we need to do it now. Oh, he tells the analogy of a farmer and a seed. He tells the analogy of the ten virgins, and it says that they were there waiting for the groom to come. Oh, and it says five of them were ready, and five of them were not. Oh, my friend, he tells about this idea of how important it is for us to be ready for the coming of the Lord. Oh, but then there's a third one, and this is the one I'll focus on today, the parable that Jesus tells about the investor as well. Matthew chapter 25 Tells us of this, and I'm going to read it to you this morning. It's Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 14. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. Should have went ahead and marked it before I got up here. Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 14, it says, Again, it is like a man going on a journey who called his servants, by the way, and entrusted them with the wealth that he had. And then he goes on and says, to one he gave five bags of gold, to another he gave two bags of gold, to another he gave one, each according to their abilities. Then he went on a journey. The man who had received the five bags of gold went at once and put the money to work and gave five bags more. So also the man with two bags of gold that he had gained and gained two more. But the man who had received the one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and buried his master's money. After a long time, oh, the master of the servants returned, and he settled the accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold bought it to the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master said, well done. Thy good and faithful servant, you have been faithful with a few. I will put you in charge of many. Come and share in your master's blessings. The man who had two bags also came to him and said, Master, you entrusted me with two bags. I've gained two more. His master replied, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few. I put you in charge of many. Come and share the happiness of your master. Then the man who had received the one bag came. Master, he said, I knew you to be a harsh man, harvesting where you didn't sow, gathering where you didn't plant. And so I was afraid, and I went out and hid your money in the ground. And here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So, so you know that I harvest where I did not sow. That was stupid of him to say, wasn't it? And gather where I did not scatter. Well, then you should have put my money and deposited it in the bank. So at least then you would have had a return. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to one who had ten. Whoever's been given will be given in abundance. Whoever has done little, it'll be taken away. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's talk about that passage of scripture. He first, in this passage of scripture, talks about an investor. There is a man who has to invest in this parable, representing none other than Jesus Christ himself. How many of y'all know Jesus has got plenty? Amen. He's got everything you need. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. There's nothing he can't supply. This man came and he had plenty. He's an investor at this time in this passage for which we read. And he invests in each one. And there is an expectation of a return on what he gave in this passage. And so here we see first the working that's going on. There was an understanding they were to take the money and they were then to invest it and they were then to be responsible for what they were given. And notice it says here, every one of them was given something. Amen. Now, I need you to understand something. Every person is equally important in the work of Almighty God. Everybody's got a job to do. Everybody's got something. He said he gave them according to their ability. Not everybody's a Billy Graham. 
Not everybody's a foreign missionary, but everybody's a believer that needs to be working and laboring in the field of God and doing all that they can for Jesus every single day of your life. See, God has invested in you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, his first investment was he purchased you by the blood of Jesus. My friend, he paid a mighty high price by allowing his son to go to that cross to shed his blood so that you could be redeemed and paid for, my friend. Imagine yourself on, the, uh, on a block being sold into slavery and Jesus paid the price by the blood of his son to set you free. He has invested the blood of his son in you today. Oh, but not only has he purchased you, he filled you with his Holy Spirit. God has not only paid your price into heaven, but he has filled you with the Spirit of God. He indwells within you today. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the dwelling place of the presence of God. God dwells in you today. Oh, but my friend, he also not only purchased you and filled you, he's equipped you. He's given you gifts of the Spirit by which we then use them for the community of God to serve him in every single way. Oh, I'm telling you, my friend, we need to understand that God has invested in you. Maybe you don't feel you're significant today, but my friend, I tell you, you are. Every believer has a job to do. Every believer becomes a laborer for God. And everything, everybody is important to God. If you would imagine an assembly line for vehicles today and everybody's doing something and somebody's putting the motor in and somebody's putting the wires in and somebody's putting this in and that into the other and maybe that one person that's putting the nut on the bolt behind your steering wheel might not seem that significant to you when you're watching it go down a production line but I promise you the first curve you hit on that new car you're going to appreciate the man that put that steering wheel on your car. It's the little things that matter. It's those little things that we do for God that are investments to him. Everybody is supposed to be working for God. What are you doing for God? We're doing a lot for us. We're always looking after us. What are you doing with the investment that God has placed in you? You're to be a laborer in the field. There's a working. Oh, but my friend, there's also a waiting. It says in this passage, and then this investor goes away for a long time. Oh, I'm telling you a picture of the ascension of Jesus Christ. He told us then, he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will return again to receive you unto myself that where I am, you may be also. Oh, the, la the owner has done gone, my friend. And he's been gone for a long time. Amen? There have been some 2,000 years to have transpired since the time that Jesus ascended. But I'm reminded when Jesus was ascending into heaven, the Bible says the disciples were standing there with their hands. Well, they probably didn't have pockets back then. But they're standing there with their hands in the pockets. Look it up. And the angel said unto them, why are you standing here looking up into heaven? The one who went up is coming back down. Oh, my friend, we got our head in the air. We got our eyes in the sky. But there's a harvest out here, and we need to be busy working for God today. He didn't save you to sit on a pew and look up and hope he returns. He saved you to get busy and to work for him. There's a working that he expects. He says for a long time. And the imagery here that we find is almost as if they didn't expect his return. They didn't expect his return. Jesus said, no man will know the hour when I return. Oh, my friend, we ask ourselves, why didn't Jesus just tell us? Why didn't he just let us know April 30th, 2029? I'm coming back because we just wait and waste our time all the way to April, it, wouldn't we? And Jesus said, you're never going to know the day I'm going to come. And because of that, my friend, he came and he came by surprise. Oh, when the cat's away, the mice shall play. When the boss leaves the building, my friend, the workers 
go on and begin to take a break. And the truth of the matter is, is that it gives us the imagery here in this passage that they had lost their vision for the return of the Lord. Can I tell you something, my friend? I believe with all of my heart, the church has lost their vision for the return of the Lord. I believe that like those ten virgins, many of us have fallen asleep. We're sitting by the wayside, minding our own business, doing our own thing. We forgot that Jesus is coming back, and it just might be right now. Are you ready? What if this very second I can't finish this sermon because Jesus cracks the eastern sky, and my friend, we go home to be with the Lord. What if that day is the day? Are you ready to stand before the Lord? He tells us there's a waiting, and they're waiting for God. We need to have an expectancy within our life, church. We need to wake up and get ready, have those wicks trimmed, be ready for the coming of the Lord because it could be today. Oh, but there's also not only the waiting, there's the, the warning. He says, I'm coming back. I'm, I'm coming back. And oftentimes we find that to be glorious and we talk about it and we sing about it and different things. Oh, the Lord's coming back. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. But in this, this passage, in the other parables that Jesus told, there's also an accounting of how faithful or unfaithful we've been. And so we need to understand that on the coming of the Lord, my friend, there will be a time of reckoning. He tells in this passage I just read to you. He said, and when the owner returned, he settled the score. He settled the balances. Oh, my friend, there's a settling of the balances. I want you to understand, I, I worked in tobacco, bell pepper, you name it. We did it in the farm. My grandfather would show up at the end of the day, at the end of that row. He set us on one end. We'd have to go through and say top and sucker a whole field of tobacco. When we were done that afternoon, he'd be sitting there, and he'd pay you at the end. I got a $2 bill, and that probably sounds like a lot of money to some of y'all. But I got a $2 bill. Because my grandfather was there to settle the score. And if you didn't work, you didn't get no money. Oh, my friend Jesus says that, man, the owner come back and he settled the score. All we need to understand, my friend, there's a moment, there's a time when the faithful will be blessed. And when the slothful will suffer loss. You hear me? The faithful will be blessed. The slothful will suffer loss. What will you have to show with your life when Jesus returns? Because he's coming again. Oh, we see the warning that's here, but then we see the witness because it says that he brought all three of these individuals before him. And the first two heard these words, these beautiful, beautiful words, well done. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with what I have given you in your life. What a beautiful moment we will have when we stand before God and he looks at our life and he says, well done, well done, well done with how you've lived your life. My friend, I don't care how many boats you have. I don't care how many homes you have. I don't care how what you got in your bank account. My friend, you better be working so that you can hear them words well done. You see, my friend, my wife likes basically what I would call beef jerky. If they ask her how she wants her to say, well done. I don't care nothing about that steak, but I sure want Jesus to say it when he looks at me. Amen. Well done. All the way through, you've done a good job, son. You've served me faithfully. Well done, thy servant. Well done. Oh, but my friend, he says that now to these faithful, he says, enter into the blessings of the Lord. See, there's going to be a banquet, the Bible says, a, a banquet, a wedding feast that's going to happen in heaven. And we're going to be sitting at that table, and we're going to be enjoying the banquet of the Lord. I hope there's chicken on there. I just got me a little bucket of chicken today right there that was given. I hope there's chicken on the buffet, but really it don't matter, does it? But there's going to be a banquet table 
there's going to be a celebration that we're allowed to go in. Can I ask you something? Who's, who's going to be sitting at your table? Who's going to look at you and say thank you for what you did so that I could be here? On that labor day, when we celebrate our labors, who's going to be sitting at your table? And say, thank you for what you did today. There's a beautiful song written by Ray Bolts many years ago. It's called Thank You. I'm just going to read a little bit of the verses. In this, past, in this uh, song, he says, and he said, friend, you may not know me now. But then he said, but wait. You used to teach my Sunday school when I was only eight. And every week you would say a prayer before that class would start. And one day when you said that prayer, I asked Jesus into my heart. Then another man stood before me and said, remember the time a missionary came to your church? And his pictures made you cry. You didn't have much money. Oh, but you gave it anyway. Jesus took the gift you gave, and that is why I'm here today. One by one they came, as far as the eye could see. Each life somehow touched by your generosity. Little things that you had done, sacrifices made, unnoticed on the earth, in heaven now proclaimed. And I know up in heaven you're not supposed to cry. But I am almost sure there were tears in your eyes when Jesus took your hand and you stood before the Lord and he said, my child, look around you for great is your reward. Thank you for giving to the Lord. 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 I am a life that was changed. Who's going to be sitting at your table? How many lives have you invested in? How, how much have you taken of what God gave you and gave to somebody else? Who's going to be sitting at your table? I'm going to have a gentleman I led to the Lord in a hospital and took the little wash tub he had beside his bed and baptized him that day and died two days later. I'm going to have my son, whom I led to the Lord at the age of 14 and baptized two weeks later. There's going to be a lot of people. And it's going to be a bounty to understand to see their smiling faces at a table and know that you had a little something to do with that. Isn't it? But there's only one person in this story that doesn't have a happy ending. The one who did nothing with what God gave him. Now, he was a child of God because he invested in him the way he did the others. All three were invested in. All three. So we know he was a child of God. But you know what? I believe the closest thing to hell that a believer will ever feel will be the moment you show up before God and have nothing to show. For what he gave you. What a sad day. When you look in his eyes and realize all he did for you. And you got to look at him and say, I got nothing, God. I got nothing. Let us labor while we still can. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, God, that you have given us so much. You gave us your son, to die for our sins. You equipped us, Lord, with the Holy Spirit within our lives. There is not a soul here that is not important to your kingdom. There is not a soul here that is not expected to then become a laborer for you. Today, Lord, I 
want to say thank you for every person that labors in this church. It is seen and it is beautiful. And Father, we want our lives to mean something. We want to invest in others. So God, in our own way, in the ways that we've been gifted, let us use it for your glory so that in the end, we will hear those words, well done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. This time we're going to